from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Watcher from the Sky by August Derleth The following being the deposition of Abel Keen. Abel Keen, Abel Keen, Abel Keen. Sometimes I am constrained to speak my name aloud, as if to reassure myself that all is as before, that indeed I am Abel Keen, and I find myself walking to the mirror and looking at myself, scrutinizing the familiar lineaments for any sign of change, as if there must be change, as if surely some time change must come, the change that marks the experiences of that week. Or was it but a week? Or less? I do not any longer have assurance of anything. It is a terrible thing to lose faith in the world of daylight and the night of stars, to feel that at any time all the known laws of space and time may be abrogated, may be thrust aside as if by some sorcery, by ancient evil known only to a few men, whose voices are indeed voices crying in the wilderness. I have hesitated until now to tell what I know of the fire which destroyed a great portion of a certain seaport town on the Massachusetts coast of the abomination which existed there. But events have dictated that I hesitate no longer. There are things men should not know, and it is always difficult for any one man to decide whether to make certain facts known or to hold them in abeyance. There was a reason for the fire. A reason known only to two people, though surely there were others who suspected, but not outside that shunned town. It has been said that if any man had a vision of the incredible vastness of outer space and the knowledge of what exists there, that alone would drive him stark raving mad. But there are things that go on within the boundaries of our own small earth, which are no less frightening things that bind us to the entire cosmos, to colossi of time and space, to evil and horror so old, so ancient, that the entire history of mankind is but a vapor in the air beside him. Of such was the reason for that destructive fire, that fire which destroyed far more than it was meant to destroy, block after block of that loath town across to the Maxionet, on the one side and to the shore of the sea on another. They called it arson, but only for a little while. They found some of those little stones, but there was nothing but one mention in the papers of either arson or those peculiar stone pieces. The townspeople saw to that. They were quick to suppress it. Their own fire examiners put out an entirely different story. They said that the man who was lost in a fire had fallen asleep beside his lamp, and had knocked it over, and that was the way the fire started. But it was arson, technically speaking, justifiable arson. Evil is a special province, surely, of the student of divinity. Such was I on that summer night, when I unlocked the door of my room at my lodging house number 17, Thoreau Drive, in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, and found lying on my bed a strange man, clad in alien garments, lying in a deep sleep from which I could not at first awaken him. Since my door was locked, he must have entered by way of the open window, but of how he had come, by what incredible passage I was not immediately to know. After my initial surprise had passed, I examined my visitor. He was a young man of approximately thirty years of age. He was clean-shaven, dark-skinned, and lithe. 
He was clothed in loose flowing robes of a material foreign to me, and he wore sandals made from the leather of some beast whose identity was unknown to me. Though it was evident that he carried various articles in the pockets of that strange clothing, I did not examine them. He was in a sleep so deep that it was impossible to awaken him, and evidence showed that he had virtually fallen across the bed and had gone instantly to sleep. I discovered at once that there was something familiar about his features, familiar with that strange insistence so commonly associated with people whom one has known before, perhaps casually, but nevertheless has known. Either I had my visitor's acquaintance, or I had seen his picture somewhere. It occurred to me at this point that I might well attempt to learn his identity while he slept, and accordingly I drew a chair up to the bed and sat down beside my visitor, intending to practice auto-suggestion, which I had learned from indulgence in my lesser professional existence. For while working my way through divinity school, I appeared thrice weekly on public and occasionally on private stages as an amateur hypnotist, and some small study of the human mind had enabled me to accomplish various trivial successes in mind reading and allied matters. However, Deep as his sleep was, he was aware. I cannot explain this even now, but it was as if though his body slept, his senses did not, for he spoke as I leaned above him, motivated by my intention, and he spoke out of a patent awareness which must be related to his strange way of life, about which I learned later, a development from a supersensory existence. Wait, he said. And then, be patient, Abel Keen. And suddenly, a most curious reaction was manifest within myself. It felt precisely as if someone or something had invaded me, as if my visitor spoke to me without words, to tell me his name, for his lips did not appear to move. Yet I was distinctly aware of the impression of words. I am Andrew Phelan. I left this room two years ago. I have come back for a little while. Thus directly, thus simply, I knew, and I knew too that I had seen Andrew Phelan's likeness in the Boston papers at the time of his utterly outré disappearance from this very room two years previously, a disappearance never satisfactorily explained. Excitement possessed me. So strong was my impression of his awareness despite his aspect of sleep, that I could not forbear asking him, Where have you been? Saleno, came his prompt reply, but whether he actually spoke or whether he merely communicated it to me without words, I cannot now say. And where was Saleno, I wondered. He woke at two o'clock in the morning. Tired myself, I had fallen into a light slumber from which I was awakened by his hand on my shoulder. I was startled and gazed up to find his firm eyes looking steadily and appraisingly at me. He was still clad in his curious robe, but his first thought was for clothing. Have you an extra suit? Yes. I shall need to borrow it. We are not unlike in build, and I cannot go out like this. Will you mind? No, by all means. I am sorry to have deprived you of your bed but my long journey tired me very much. If I may ask, how did you get in? He gestured to the window. Why here? Because this room was my point of contact. He answered enigmatically. He then looked at his watch. The suit now, if you don't mind. My time is short. I felt impelled to get the clothing he wished and did so. When he disrobed, I saw that he was very strong, very muscular and he moved with an agility that made me doubt my first guess as to his age. I said nothing as he dressed. He remarked casually on the good fit of the suit, which was not my best, though it was neat and clean, and had just been pressed. I told him equally as casually that he was welcome to it for as long as he needed it. The landlady is still Mrs. Breyer, he asked then. Yes. I hope you will say nothing to her of me. It would only trouble her. To no one? No one. He began to move to the door, and instantly I apprehended that he meant to be gone. At the same time, I was aware of not wanting him to leave. 
without imparting to me more information about the mystery which had remained unsolved for two years. Rashly, I sprang up and threw myself between him and the door. He looked at me with calm, amused eyes. Wait, I cried. You can't go like this. What is it you want? Let me get it for you. He smiled. I seek evil, Mr. Keene. Evil that is more terrible than anything taught in your school of divinity, believe me. Evil is my field, Mr. Phelan. I guarantee nothing, he replied. The risks are too great for ordinary men. An insane impulse took possession of me. I was seized with the urgent desire to accompany my visitor, even if it became necessary to hypnotize him. I fixed his strange eyes with mine. I reached out my hands, and then something happened to me. I found myself suddenly on another plane, in another dimension, as it were. I felt that I had taken Andrew Phelan's place on the bed, and yet accompanied him in spirit. For instantly, soundlessly, painlessly, I was out of this world. Nothing else would describe the sensations I experienced for the remainder of that night. I saw, I heard, I felt and tasted, and smelled things utterly alien to my consciousness. He did not touch me. He only looked at me. Yet, I apprehended instantly that I stood on the edge of an abyss of horror unimaginable. Whether he led me to the bed or whether I made my own way there, I do not know. Yet it was on the bed that I found myself in the morning, after those memorable hours of the remainder of that night. Did I sleep and dream? Or did I lie in hypnosis and know because Phelan willed me to know all that took place? It was better for my sanity to believe that I dreamed. And what dreams! What magnificent and yet terror-fraught images wrought by the subconscious! And Andrew Phelan was everywhere in those dreams. I saw him in that darkness, making his way to a bus station, taking a bus. I saw him in the bus, as if I sat beside him. I saw him alight at ancient, legend-haunted, and shunned Innsmouth, after changing buses at Arkham. I was beside him when he prowled down along that wrecked waterfront with its sinister ruins, and I saw where he paused, before that disguised refinery and later at that one-time Masonic Hall, which now bore over its doorway the curious legend, Esoteric Order of Dagon. And yet more, I witnessed the beginning of that strange pursuit, when the first of those hideous, frog-like men emerged from the shadows along the Manuxed River, and took up the trail of Andrew Phelan, the uncanny silent followers after the seeker of evil, until Phelan turned his depths away from Innsmouth. All night long, hour after hour, until the sun rose and dream and actuality became one, and I opened my eyes to look at Andrew Phelan entering my room. I pulled myself together, smiling sheepishly, and swung to the edge of the bed where I sat looking at him. I think you owe me an explanation, I said. It is better not to know too much, he answered. One cannot fight evil without knowledge, I retorted. He said nothing in reply, but I pressed him. He sat down somewhat wearily. Did he not think that some explanation ought to be given me? I demanded. He then countered with an enigmatic suggestion that there were certain age-old horrors which were better left unrevealed. This only excited my curiosity the more. Did it not occur to me he wanted to know? that there might be certain dislocations in space and time, infinitely more terrible than any known horror? Had I never thought that there might be other planes, other dimensions beyond the known planes and dimensions? Had I not considered that space might exist in different folds, that time might be a dimension capable of being traveled backward as well as forward? He spoke to me thus in riddles, and carried on in this fashion despite all my attempts to question him. I'm only trying to protect you, Keene, he said finally, still with infinite patience. Did you escape your pursuer in Innsmouth last night? He nodded. You knew of them? Yes. 
or you would not have been aware of him, for in your, shall we say, hypnosis, you could only know such things of which I was cognizant. I suggest to you, Keen, that hypnotism is a dangerous means. I thought it might serve as a warning if it were turned back upon you last night. That was not alone hypnotism. Perhaps not as you know it, he made a gesture of dismissal. Would it be possible for me to rest here for a while today, before pursuing my quest? I would not like to be discovered by Mrs. Breyer. I'll see to it that you're not disturbed. Even as I spoke, I had made up my mind what to do. I was determined that Andrew Phelan would not put me off so easily, and there was one course left open to me. I could discover certain things for myself. Despite his caution, my visitor had dropped hints and suggestions. Even beyond them, however, there was the mystery of Andrew Phelan itself that had been extensively recorded in the daily papers of that time. Certainly in those accounts I might expect to discover some clue. I adjured Phelan to make himself comfortable and departed, ostensibly for the college, but instead, once outside, I telephoned to excuse myself from that day's study. Then, after a light breakfast, I took myself off to the Widener Library in Cambridge. Andrew Phelan had said that he had come from Salerno. This hint was too patent for me to overlook, so forthwith I set myself to track down Salerno. I found it sooner than I had expected to find it, but it solved nothing. If anything, it served only to deepen the mystery of Andrew Phelan. For Salerno was one of the stars in the Pleiades cluster of Taurus. I turned next to the files of the newspapers concerning Phelan's vanishing, early in September 1938. I hoped to discover in the accounts of this remarkable disappearance, without trace from out the window of that same room to which he had now returned, something to lead me to some feasible explanation. But as I read the accounts, my perplexity deepened. There was a singularly complete puzzlement expressed in the newspapers. But there were certain dark hints certain vague and ominous suggestions which fastened to my awareness. Phelan had been employed by Dr. Laban Shrewsbury of Arkham. Like Phelan, Dr. Shrewsbury had spent some years in a strange and never explained absence from his home, to which he had returned as queerly as now Andrew Phelan had come back. Shortly before Phelan's disappearance, Dr. Shrewsbury's house, together with the doctor himself, had been destroyed by fire. Phelan's task had apparently been secretarial, but he had spent a good deal of time in the library of Miskatonic University in Arkham. So it seemed to me that the only definite clue offered to me at the Widener was in Arkham, for the records of the Miskatonic University library should certainly reveal what books Phelan had consulted, presumably in the interest of the late Dr. Shrewsbury. Only an hour had now elapsed, there was ample time for me to pursue my search, so forthwith I took a bus out of Boston for Arkham, and in a comparatively short time I was put down not far from the institution within the walls of which I believed I would discover some further information about Andrew Phelan's pursuits. My inquiry about the records of books used by Andrew Phelan was met with a curious kind of retinence and resulted in my being shown ultimately into the office of the director of the library, Dr. Lanfer, who wished to know why I sought to consult certain books always kept under lock and key by the express order of the library's directors. I explained that I had become interested in the disappearance of Andrew Phelan and in the work he had been doing. His eyes narrowed. Are you a reporter? I'm a student, sir. Fortunately, I had with me my college credentials. I lost no time in showing them to him. Very well, he nodded, and however reluctantly, wrote out the desired permission on a slip of paper and handed it to me. It is only fair to tell you, Mr. Keene, that of the several people who have consulted these books at length, few, if any, are alive to tell about it. On this singularly sinister note, I was shown out of his office and presently found myself being conveyed to a little room that was hardly more than a cubicle, where I sat down, 
while the attendant assigned to me placed before me certain books and papers, chief among them and obviously the most prized possession of the library. Judging by the almost reverent way in which the attendant handled it, was an ancient volume entitled simply Nucanomicon by an Arab, Abdul Azared. The record showed that Phelan had consulted this volume on several occasions, but much to my chagrin, it was clear that this volume was not for the uninitiated, for it contained references which for ambiguity were unexcelled. But of one thing I could be certain. The book pertained to evil and horror, to terror and fear of the unknown, the things that walk in the night, and not alone the little night of man, but that vaster, deeper, more mysterious night of the world, the dark side of existence. I turned from this book in near despair and found myself looking into a manuscript copy of a book by Professor Shrewsbury, Cthulhu and the Necronomicon, and in these pages, quite by accident, for this book, too, consisted of learned and scholarly paragraphs concerning the lore of the Arab, most of them utterly beyond my comprehension. I came upon a certain reference, which imparted to me, and in the light of what small experience I had, already a frightening chill, and a feeling of the utmost dread. For as I scanned the pages with their enigmatic allusions to beings and places utterly alien to me, I found in the midst of a quotation purporting to be from another book entitled The Real Ye Text, the following. Great Cthulhu shall rise from Real Ye. Hastur the Unspeakable shall return from the dark star, which is in the heights near Alba de Baron. Nilar Hotep shall howl forever in the darkness, where he abideth. Shub Hib Nigaruth shall spawn his thousand young. I read and read again. It was incredible, damnable, but for the second time within twenty-four hours I had come on reference to unbelievable spaces and to stars. To a star in the Hades, a star in Taurus, and surely it could be none other than Seleno. And as if in mocking answer to the question which loomed so large before me, I turned over this manuscript and found below it a portfolio labeled in a strong, if spidery hand. Seleno fragments. I drew it toward me and found it sealed. At this the aged attendant, who had been observing me closely, came over. It has never been opened, he said. Not even by Mr. Phelan? He shook his head. Since it came by Mr. Phelan's hand, with Dr. Shrewsbury's seal on it, we do not believe he had access to it. We do not know. I looked at my watch. Time was passing now, and I meant to go on to Innsmouth before I completed my day. Reluctantly and yet with a strange sense of foreboding, I pushed away the manuscripts and books. I will come again, I promise. I want to get to Innsmouth before too much of the day has gone. The attendant favored me with a curious and reflective glaze. Yes, it is better to visit Innsmouth by day, he said finally. I pondered this a while as the old man gathered up the papers and books. Then I said, That is surely a curious statement to make, Mr. Peabody. Is there anything wrong with Innsmouth? Oh, do not ask me. I have never gone there. I have no desire to go there. There are strange things enough in Arkham without the need for going on to Innsmouth. But I have heard things, terrible things, Mr. Keene such things that it may well be said of them that it is of no account whatever whether or not they are true but of account only that they are being said what they do say of the marshes who have the refinery there refinery i cried remembering my dream yes it was old obed marsh first old captain obed they said well what does it matter he is gone, and now it is Ahab who is there, Ahab Marsh, his great-grandson. And he is no longer young, but he is not old either. They do not get very old in Innsmouth. What did they say of Obed Marsh? It does not matter to tell it, I suppose, 
Perhaps it is an old wife's tale that he was leagued with the devil and brought a great plague to Innsmouth in 1846, and that those who came after him were bound by compacts with unearthly beings from beyond that devil reef off Innsmouth Harbor and brought about the destruction by dynamite of many old houses and the wharves along the seashore there during the winter of 27 and 8. There are not many living there, and no one likes the Innsmouth people. Race prejudice? It is something about them. They do not seem like people, that is, people like the rest of us. I saw one of them once. He made me think, uh, you may think it an old man's aberration, but I assure you, it is not. He made me think of a frog. I was shaken. The creature who had so shadily crept after Andrew Phelan in my dream or vision of the night before had seemed beastily frog-like. I was at the same time possessed of the urgent desire to go to Innsmouth and see for myself the place of my dream-haunted repose. Yet, when I stood before Hammond's drug store in Market Square, waiting for the ancient and shunned bus, which carried venturesome travelers to Innsmouth and went on to Newburyport, I had a sense of impending danger so strong that I could not shake it off. Despite my insistent curiosity, I was sharply, keenly aware of a kind of sixth sense, prompting me not to take the bus driven by that queer, sullen-visaged fellow who brought the bus to a stop and came out to walk briefly, suggestively stooped, into Hammond's before setting forth on the journey to Innsmouth, the final object of my somewhat aimless search that day. I did not yield to that prompting, but climbed into the bus, which I shared with but one other passenger, whom I knew instinctively to be an Innsmouth resident, for he too had a strange cast of features, with odd decreases in the sides of his neck, a narrow-headed fellow who could not have been more than forty, with a bulging, watery blue eyes and flat nose, and curiously undeveloped ears, which I was to find so shockingly common in that shunned seaport town towards which the bus soon began to roll. The driver, too, was manifestly an Innsmouth man, and I began to understand what Mr. Peabody had meant when he spoke of the Innsmouth people as seeming somehow not like people. To the end of comparison with that following figure of my dream, I scrutinized both my fellow passenger and the driver as closely, if furtively, as I could, and I was somewhat relieved to come to the conclusion that there was a subtle difference. I could not put my finger on it, but the follower of my dream seemed malign in contrast to these people, who had merely that appearance so common to cretins and similar unfortunate individuals bearing the stigmata of lower intelligence in the realm of the subnormal, more especially than that of the abnormal. I had never before seen, been to Innsmouth. Having come down from New Hampshire to pursue my divinity studies, I had had no occasion to travel beyond Arkham. Therefore the town as I saw it, as the bus approached it, down the slope of the coastline there, had a most depressing effect on me, for it was strangely dense, and yet seemed devoid of life. No cars drove out to pass us coming in, and of the three steeples rising above the chimney pots and the crouching gambrel roofs and peaked gables, many of them sagging with decay, only one had any semblance whatsoever of use, for the others were weather-beaten, with gaps in them where shingles had been torn away, and badly needed paint. For that matter, the entire town seemed to need paint. All that is, save two buildings we passed. The two buildings of my dream. The refinery and that imposing pillared hall standing among the churches which clustered about the radial point of the town streets with its black and gold sign on the pediment so vividly remembered from my experience of the previous night. Esoteric Order of Dagon. This structure, like that of the Marsh Refining Company along the Manuxet River, seemed to have been given a coat of paint only recently. Apart from this, and a single store of the first national chain, all the buildings 
in what was apparently the business district of the town were repellently old, with paint peeling from them and their windows badly in need of washing. It was so too of the town generally, though the old residential streets of Broad, Washington, Lafayette, and Adams were lived still those who were left of Innsmouth's old families, the Marshes, the Gilmans, the Elliots, and the Waits, were of a fresher appearance, not so much an obvious need of paint as of repurposing for the grounds grew wild and rank, and in many cases fences now overgrown with vines, had been constructed to make the casual view of passerby difficult. Repelled as I was by the Innsmouth people, I stood for a few moments on the curb, after having left the bus and ascertained the hours when it would return to Arkham, at seven that evening, wondering just what course it would be best to follow. I had no desire to speak to the people of Innsmouth, for I had the strongest of forebodings that to do so was to court subtle and insidious danger. Yet, I continued to be impelled by the curiosity which had brought me here. It occurred to me, as I stood pondering, that the manager of the first national chain store might very well not be one of the Innsmouth people. It was the custom of the chain to move its managers around, and there was just a chance that the man in charge of this store was an outsider. For among these people, it was inevitable that anyone from beyond the immediate vicinity would be made to feel tangibly that he was an outsider. Accordingly, I made my way over to the corner where the store stood and entered it. Contrary to my expectations, there were no clerks, but only a man of middle age who was at work on a prosaic display of canned goods as I entered and asked for the manager. But clearly he was the manager. He did not bear any of those oddly shocking distinguishing marks so common to the people of Innsmouth. So he was, as I had guessed, an outsider. I observed with a faint sense of unpleasant distaste that he was startled to look at me and seemed hesitant to speak. But I realized immediately that this was no doubt due to his isolation among these curiously decayed people. Having introduced myself and observed aloud that I could recognize him for an outsider like myself, I at once pursued my inquiry. What was it about these Inmouth people? I wanted to know. What was the esoteric order of Dagon? And what was being said about Ahab Marsh? His reaction was instantaneous, nor was it entirely unexpected. He became agitated. He glanced fearfully toward the entrance to the store and then came over to seize me, almost roughly by the arm. We don't talk about such things here, he said in a harsh whisper. His nervous fear was only too manifest. I'm sorry if I distressed you, I went on, but I'm only a casual traveler and I'm curious as to why such a potentially fine port should be all but abandoned. Indeed, it is virtually abandoned. The wharves have not been repaired and many businesses places seem closed. He shuddered. Do they know you are asking questions? You're the only and first person to whom I have spoken. Thank God. Take my advice and leave town as soon as you can. You can take a bus. I came in on the bus. I want to know something about the town. He looked at me indecisively, glanced once more toward the entrance and then turning abruptly and walking along a counter toward a curtained door, which apparently shut off his own quarters, he said, come along with me, Mr. Keene. In his own rooms at the rear of the store, he began, however reluctantly, to talk in harsh whispers, as if he feared the very walls might hear. What I wanted to know, he said, was impossible to tell, because there was no proof of it. All was talk, talk and the terrible decay of isolated families, intermarrying generation after generation, that accounted in part for what he called the Innsmouth look. It was true, old Captain Obed Marsh held commerce with the far corners of the earth, and he brought strange things, and some said strange practices like the seafarer's kind of pagan worship called the esoteric order of Dagon, 
back to Innsmouth with him. It was said that he held stranger commerce with creatures that rose the dark of the moon out of the deep sea beyond Devil Reef and met him at the reef a mile and a half out from shore. But he knew of no one who had seen them. Though it was said that in the winter of the year when the federal government had destroyed the waterfront buildings, a submarine had gone out and discharged torpedoes straight down into the unfathomable depths beyond Devil Reef. He spoke persuasively and well. Perhaps indeed he knew no more, but I felt undeniably the lacunae in his story, the unanswered questions being inherent in all that he said. There were stories about Captain Obed Marsh, yes. Because of them, there were stories about all the marshes. But there were stories about the Waits, the Gilmans, the Orns, and the Elliots, too. About all the old, one-time wealthy families. And it was true that it was not wise to linger in the vicinity of the Marsh Refining Company building, or near the order of Dagon Hall. At this point, our conversation was interrupted by the tinkling of the bell. Announcing a customer and Mr. Henderson immediately left to answer the summons. I peered curiously from between the folds of the curtain and saw that a woman had come in, an Innsmouth woman, for her appearance was instantly chilling and repulsive. There was something more than just similarity to the men about her. There was a kind of almost reptilian menace, and she spoke in a thick mutation of speech. Though Henderson seemed to understand it all right, and waited on her without comment of any kind, save to answer her questions with an air that was rather more than just civil, rather subservient. That was one of the wait women, he said in answer to my question when he returned. They're all like that. And the marsh women were before them. The marshes are all gone now, all except Ahab and the two old women. The refinery still runs then? A little. The marshes still have some ships. There was a long time after the government was here when they had nothing at all in the way of ships. Then, in the middle thirties, they bought a few again. This Ahab came up from nobody knows where, just came in on a ship one day, they say, and took over where the marshes left off. Cousin or great-grandson, they say. Saw him once, and that at a distance. Doesn't go out much except to the hall. The marshes always did sort of run that show. The esoteric order of Dagon, he explained, in response to my insistent prying, was a kind of ancient worship, pagan certainly, and outsiders were rigidly excluded from any knowledge of it. It was not healthy even to ask about it. My schooling rebelled at this, and I demanded to know what part the ministers of the other churches were playing in this. To this he responded with a further question. Why not ask denominational headquarters for this district? I would discover that the various denominations disowned their own churches, and the pastors of those churches had sometimes simply disappeared, and at other times had undergone strange reversions to primitive and pagan ceremonies in their worship. Everything he said was disturbing far beyond anything within the limits of my experience. And yet, what he said was not nearly so terrifying as what remained only implied in his words. The vague hints of terrifying evil, of evil from outside, the hideous suggestiveness of what had taken place between the marshes and those creatures from the deep, the lurking, unvoiced assumption of what went on at the meetings of the esoteric order of Dagon. Something had happened here in 1928, something terrible, enough to be kept out of the press, something to bring the federal government down to the scene and to justify the havoc wrought along the ocean's edge in the wharf district of this old fishing town. I knew enough biblical history to know that Dagon was the ancient fish-like god of the Philistines who rose from the waters of the Red Sea. But there was ever present in my thoughts the belief that the Dagon of Innsmouth was but a fictive mask of that earlier pagan god, that the Dagon of Innsmouth was the symbol of something noxious and infinitely terrible, 
something that might account not only for the curious aspect of the Innsmouth people, but also for the fact that Innsmouth was shunned and forsaken, let alone by the rest of the towns in its vicinity and forgotten by the outside world. I pressed the storekeeper for something definite, but he could not or would not give it. Indeed, he began to act as time wore on as if I had already been told far too much. His agitation increased and presently I thought it best to take my leave. Though Henderson implored me not to carry on any overt investigation, saying at the last that people had been known to drop out of sight and the Lord alone knows where. Nobody ever found the clue as to where they went and I reckon nobody ever will, but they know. On this sinister note, I took my leave. Time did not permit much further exploration, but I managed to walk about a few of the streets and lanes of Innsmouth near the bus station and found everything in a state of curious decay and most of the buildings giving off besides the familiar odor of old wood and stone, a strange watery essence as of the sea. Further, I could not go for I was disturbed by the queer glances given me by the few inhabitants I passed on the streets, and I was ever conscious of being under surveillance from behind closed doors and window curtains. But most of all, I was horribly aware of a kind of aura of malevolence, so keenly aware of it indeed that I was glad when at last the time came for me to take the bus and make my way back to Arkham and thence to my room in Boston. Andrew Phelan was waiting for me when I returned. The night was almost half gone, but Phelan had not left my room. I thought he looked at me a little pityingly when I entered. I have often worked and wondered why it is that human curiosity is insatiable, he said, but I suppose it is too much to expect that one who has had an experience like yours, so far from the norm of things, as most of us know it, should accept it without seeking explanation other than I gave you. You know? Where you have been? Yes. Did anyone follow you, Abel? I didn't look to see. He shook his head mutely. And did you learn what you sought to learn? I confess that I was more puzzled than ever. And yes, a little more disturbed than I had been at first. Seleno, I said, what have you been telling me? We were both there, he said bluntly, Dr. Shrewsbury and I. For a moment I thought he was resorting to bluff, but there was something in his attitude that forbade levity. He was grim, unsmiling. You think that is impossible. You are bound by your own laws. Do not think further of it, but simply accept what I say for the time being. For years Dr. Shrewsbury and I have been on the trail of a great evil being determined to close the avenues by which he may return to terrestrial life out of his enchanted prison beneath the sea. Listen to me, Abel, and understand in what deadly peril you stood this afternoon in a cursed inn's mouth. Thereupon, he launched into a soul-shaking account of incredible ancient evil, of great old ones akin to the elemental forces, the fire being Cthulhu the water being Cthulhu, the lords of air, your Igor Hastor the unspeakable, Zar, and Ithaqua, the earth creature Nilahotep, and others, long ago cast out and imprisoned by the spells of the elder gods who exist near the star Betelgeuse, the great old ones who have their minions, their secret followers among men and beasts, whose task it is to prepare the way for their second coming for it is their evil intention to come again and rule the universe as once they did after their breaking away and escape from the domain of the ancient ones. What he told me then evoked frightening parallels to what I had read in those forbidden books at the library of Miskatonic University. Only that afternoon and he spoke in a voice of such conviction and with such assurance that I found myself shaken free from the orthodox learning to which I had been accustomed. The human mind, faced with something utterly beyond its ken, inevitably reacts in one of two ways. Its initial impulse is to reject in toto, its secondary to accept tentatively, but in the dread unfolding of Andrew Phelan's explanation, 
there was the damnable, inescapable fact that only such an explanation could fit all the events which had taken place since his strange appearance in my room. Of the abominable tapestry of explanation which Phelan wove, several aspects were most striking and at the same time most incredible. Dr. Shrewsbury and he, Phelan said, had been in search of the openings by means of which great Cthulhu might rise from where he lies, sleeping in his house at Rillier, an undersea place, Cthulhu apparently being amphibious, under the protection of an ancient, enchanted, five-pointed carven gray stone from ancient Minar. They need not fear the minions who serve the great old ones, the deep ones, the Shogoths, the Shocho people, the Doles and the Vormis, the Volusians and all similar creatures. But their activities had finally aroused the superior beings directly serving great Cthulhu, against whom the five-pointed star is powerless. Therefore, Dr. Shrewsbury and he had taken flight by summoning from interstellar space the strange bat-like creatures, the servants of Hastor, him who is not to be named, ancient rival of Cthulhu. And after having partaken of a golden mead which rendered them insensible to the effects of time and space and enabled them to travel in these dimensions while at the same time heightening their sensory perceptions to an unheard of extent they set out for Salerno where they had resumed their studies in the library of monolithic stones with books and hieroglyphs stolen from the elder gods by the great old ones at and subsequent to the time of the revolt from the benign authority of those gods. Nevertheless, though on Seleno they were not unaware of what took place on earth, and they had learned that commerce was again being carried on between the deep ones and the strange people of haunted Innsmouth. And one of those people, at least, was a leader in preparing the way for the return of Cthulhu. To forestall that one, Dr. Shrewsbury had sent him, Andrew Phelan, back to earth. What was the commerce between the Innsmouth people and the creatures who came up out of the sea to Devil Reef? Surely that should have been obvious to you in Innsmouth. That storekeeper said it was too much intermarriage. Phelan smiled grimly. Yes, but not among those old families of Innsmouth. It was with those evil beings from the deep, from Yahal Nethe, below Devil Reef, and the esoteric order of Dagon, is but a deceptive name for the organization of worshippers to do the bidding of Cthulhu and his servants to prepare the way to open the gate into this upper world for their hellish dominion. I pondered the shocking revelation for a full minute before I offered anything more. Accepting everything Phelan had said and his attitude seemed to say that it made no difference to him whether or not I believed him. It would appear that as soon as his mission had been accomplished, Phelan himself planned to return to Seleno. I put that to him. Yes, he admitted it was so. Then you already know who is in Innsmouth, who is leading the people back once more to the worship of Cthulhu and the traffic with the Deep Ones. Let us say rather that I suspect it is the evident one. Ahab Marsh? Ahab Marsh, yes. It was his great-grandfather, Obed, who began it. Obed with his wide travels and the strange places he visited. Obed, we knew now, encountered the Deep Ones on an island in the mid-Pacific, an island where no island should have been, and he opened the way for them to come to Innsmouth. The marshes grew wealthy, but they were no more immune to that accursed physiological change than the others in that shunned and unholy settlement. The taint is in the blood now. It has been there for generations. The events of 1928 to 1929, when the federal government invaded Innsmouth, put a stop to it for only a few years, less than a decade, with the coming of Ahab Marsh, and none knows whence he came, though the two old Marsh women who were left accepted him as their own. The thing began once more, and this time less overtly so that this time there will be no calling out to the Federals. I have come out of the sky to watch, 
and prevent horror from being spawned again on this earth. I cannot fail. I must succeed. But how? Events will show. Tomorrow I am going to Innsmouth, where I will continue to watch until I can take action. The storekeeper told me that all outsiders are watched and regarded with suspicion. But I will go in their guise. All that night I lay sleepless besides Andrew Phelan, torn by the desire to accompany him. If his story were the figment of his imagination, surely it was a glorious and wondrous tale, calculated to stir the pulse and fire the mind. If it were not, then with equal certainty it was as much my responsibility as it was his to lay hands upon and destroy the evil at Innsmouth. For evil is the ancient enemy of all good, whether as we who are Christians understand it, or whether as it is understood in some prehistoric mythos. My studies in divinity seemed suddenly almost frivolous in contrast to what Phelan had narrated. Though I confess that at the time I still entertained doubts of some magnitude, for how could I do else? Were not the monstrous entities of evil feeling conjured up well nigh impossible to conceive, to say nothing of expecting belief in them? Indeed they were. Yet it is man's spiritual burden that he finds it so easy to doubt, always to doubt, and so difficult to believe even in the simplest things. And the striking parallel which forced itself upon me, a divinity student, a parallel which could not be overlooked, was plain. The similarity between the tale of the revolt of the great old ones against the elder gods and that other more universally known tale of the revolt of satan against the forces of the lord in the morning i told Phelan of my decision he shook his head it is good of you to want to help abel but you have no real understanding of what it means i've given you only a spare outline nothing more i would not be justified in involving you the responsibility is mine. No, the responsibility is always that of the man who knows the facts. There is far more even than Dr. Shrewsbury and I already know to be learned. Indeed, I may say that we ourselves have hardly penetrated the perimeter of the whole. Think then of how little you know. I conceive it as a duty. He gazed at me musingly, and I saw for the first time that his eyes were far older than his thirty years. Let me see. You're twenty-seven now, Abel. Do you realize that if you persist in this decision, you may not have a future? I set out patiently to argue with him. I had already dedicated my life to the pursuit and destruction of evil, and this evil he offered me in his company was something more tangible than the evil that lurks in men's soul. He smiled and shook his head at this. And so we spent words back and forth. In the end he consented, though with a kind of cynicism I found galling. The first step in our pursuit of the evil at Innsmouth was to shift our lodgings from Boston to Arkham, not only because of the proximity of Arkham to Innsmouth, but also because of the elimination of the risk of feelings being seen and recognized by my landlady, who would certainly focus highly undesirable publicity on him and such publicity, in turn, would result in knowledge of his presence terrestrially, once again being communicated to those creatures who had previously set out after Dr. Shrewsbury and Andrew Phelan, and so forced their flight. No doubt the chase would begin again, in any case but hopefully not before Phelan had accomplished what he had come back to do. We moved that night. Phelan did not think it wise of me to relinquish my Boston room, However, so I took a lease on it for a month, never dreaming how soon I would return to those familiar walls. In Arkham we found a room in a comparatively new house on Kerwin Street. Phelan later confided that the house stood on the site of Dr. Shrewsbury's home, which had been destroyed by fire coincident with his final disappearance. Having settled ourselves and carefully explained to our new landlady that we might be absent from our room for many hours at a time, we proceeded to assemble those properties which would be necessary for us to 
take up a temporary residence among the Innsmouth people, for Phelan deemed it not only wise but mandatory that in order to remain in Innsmouth comparatively free of observation, we must be made up to look as much like the Innsmouthers as possible. In the late afternoon of that day, Phelan set to work. I discovered in a very short time that he was a consummate artist with his hands. My features began to change utterly. From a rather innocuous looking and perhaps even weak appearing young fellow, I aged skillfully and began to assume the typical narrow head, flat nose, and curious ears so common to the Innsmouth people. He worked over my entire face. My mouth thickened. My skin became coarse poured. My color vanished behind a gray pallor, horrible to contemplate, and he managed even to convey a bulging and frog-like expression about my eyes, and to give my neck that oddly repellent appearance of having deep, almost scaly creases. I would not have known myself after he had finished, but the operation took better than three hours, and at the end of that time it was as permanent as it could be expected to be. It is right, he decided after he examined me, and then tirelessly without a word he set about to give himself a similar appearance. Early the next morning we left the house for Innsmouth, entertaining for Newburyport, and thus coming to Innsmouth on the bus from the other side, a deliberate maneuver on Phelan's part. By noon of that day we were established amid a few interested and curiously searching glances from the slovenly workers in the place, in the Gilman House, Innsmouth's lone open hotel, or rather in what was left of it, for like so many buildings in the town, it was in a very bad state of decay. We registered as Amos and John Wilkin, cousins, for Phelan had discovered that Wilkin was an old Innsmouth name, not at present represented by any members of the family living in that accursed seaport city. The elderly clerk in the Gilman House had given us a few sharp-eyed glances, and his bulging eyes stared at the names on his register. Related to old Jed Wilkin, be ye? he asked. My companion nodded briskly. Man can see you belong here, the clerk said, with an almost obscene chuckle. Got business? We're taking a little vacation, answered Phelan. Come to the right place, then you did. Things to see here, all right if you're the right kind. Again that distastefully suggestive chuckle. Once alone in our room, Phelan became more tense than ever. We've done well so far, but this is only the beginning. We have a good deal of work to do. I have no doubt the clerk will pass the word around that we are relatives of Jed Wilkin. That will satisfy the first questions of the curious. Moreover, our appearance as tainted like the rest of the Innsmouth or in the vicinity of those places where we might expect to encounter Ahab Marsh will not excite undue comment. But I am convinced that we must avoid being seen too closely by Ahab himself. But what good will it do for us to watch Ahab, I countered, if you are already reasonably certain that it is he? There is more to be learned about Ahab than you think, Abel perhaps more than I think. We know the Marsh family. We know the line. Dr. Shrewsbury and I. But nowhere in that family tree can we find any trace of a Marsh named Ahab. Yet he is here. Yes, indeed. But how came he here? We went out soon after, having taken care to keep to old clothes similar to those we had worn on our arrival so that we might not give off an impression of undue affluence and so attract unwelcome attention. Phelan set out immediately for the vicinity of the waterfront, detouring only once to examine the order of Dagon Hall at New Church Green and ending up at last not far from the Marsh Refining Company. It was there not long after our arrival that I had first sight of our quarry. Ahab Marsh was tall Though he walked in an odd, stooped manner, and his gait too was very strange, being not at all regular and rhythmic, but rather jerky, and even for the short distance from the refinery 
the closely curtained car in which he rode. The fashion in which he made progress was very evident. His was a gait that might have been called inhuman, for it was not so much a walk as a kind of shuffling or lurching forward, and it was movement which had little counterpart even among the other Innsmouthers, for whatever the changes in their aspects, their walk, shuffling as it was, was essentially human locomotion. As I have said, Ahab Marsh was taller than most of his fellow citizens, but his face was not much different from the features so common in Innsmouth, save in that it seemed somehow less coarse and more greasy, as if the skin for despite its sometimes lizard-like appearance, it was skin, were of a finer texture, this in turn suggesting that the marsh breed was slightly superior to that of the average Innsmouther. It was impossible to see his eyes, for they were concealed by spectacles of a deep cobalt hue, and his mouth, while in many ways similar to that of the natives, was yet different in that it seemed to protrude more doubtless because Ahab Marsh's chin receded almost into nothingness. He was literally a man without a chin. At sight of him I experienced a shudder of horror unlike any I had before undergone. For it gave him an appearance of so frighteningly lizard-like that I could not but be repelled by it. He seemed also to be earless, and wore his hat low on what appeared to be a head devoid of hair. His neck was scrawny, and though he was otherwise almost impeccably dressed, his hands were encased in black gloves, or rather mittens, as I saw at second glance. We were not observed. I had gazed at our quarry only in the most apparently casual manner, while Phelan did not look directly at him at all, but utilized a small pocket mirror to examine him even more directly. In a few moments, Ahab Marsh had vanished into his car and driven away. A hot day for gloves, was all that Phelan said. I thought so. I fear it is as I suspected, Phelan added then, but this he would not explain. We shall see. We repaired to another section of the city to wander through Innsmouth's narrow shaded streets and lanes away from the region of the Maniaxet River and the falls, close to which the marsh refinery arose on a little bluff. Phelan walked in a deep and troubled contemplation. It was evident that he was in puzzled thought, which I did not interrupt. I marveled at the incredible state of arrested decay so prevalent in this old seaport town, and even more at the curious lack of activity. It was as if by far the majority of the inhabitants rested during the day, for very few of them were to be seen on the streets. That night in Innsmouth, however, was destined to be different. As darkness came, we made our way to the order of Dagon Hall. At his one previous visit, Phelan had discovered that entrance to the hall for the ceremonies could be had only by display of a curious fish-like seal and during the time I had tried to trace his movements here, he had fashioned several of them, of which the most perfect he had reserved for his own use, and that most closely resembling it he held for me, if I cared to use it, though he preferred that I take no such risk and remain outside the hall. This, however, I was unwilling to do. It was patent that a great many people were coming to the hall, all evidently members of the esoteric order of Dagon, and I had the conviction that events I might not wish to miss might take place, this despite Phelan's insistent warning that we were placing ourselves in extreme danger by attending one of the forbidden ceremonies. Nothing daunted, I went doggedly along. Fortunately, our skills were not challenged. I shudder to imagine what might have happened if they had been. I believe that more than anything else, our having the Innsmouth look, so skillfully fabricated, accounted for our easy passage into the hall. We were the focus of obvious attention, but it was plain that word of our identity as members of the Wilkin clan had got around, for there was neither maleficence nor challenge in the eyes of men and women who looked on occasion in our direction. We took seats near the door, meaning to be off immediately if it seemed wise to leave, 
and having settled ourselves, looked around the room. The hall was large and murky. Its windows were shut off by black screens, apparently of tar paper, so that it had the appearance of an old-fashioned theater, that is, a hall converted to the showing of movie pictures when the great industry was in its infancy. Moreover, there was a brooding dusk in the room that seemed to rise from the vicinity of a small dais up front. But it was not the murkiness of the hall that seized hold of my imagination. It was the ornaments. For the hall was decorated with strange stone carvings of fish-like beings. I recognized several of them as very similar to certain primitive sculptures which had come out of Panape, and certain others bore a disturbing resemblance to inexplicable carvings found on Easter Island as well as in the Mayan ruins of Central America and the Inca remains of Peru. Even in this murky light, it was clearly to be seen that these sculptures and carvings were not done by Innsmouth hands, but that they were evidently from some foreign port. Indeed, they might well have come from Panape, since the marsh boats crossed the seas as far as the most distant corners of civilization. Only a very dim artificial light burned at the foot of the stage. Nothing else helped to illuminate the hall, yet it seemed to me that the sculptures and bas-reliefs had a hellish suggestiveness that was soul-stirring and frightening, and out of this world look which was profoundly agitating, for it spoke of time long gone by, of great ages before our time, ages when the world and perhaps the universe were young. Apart from these and from a miniature of what must have been a vast, amorphous, octopus-like creature, which occupied the center of the days, the hall was bare of everything in the way of decorations. Nothing but rickety chairs, a plain table on the days, and those tightly curtained windows to offset the effect of those alien bas-reliefs and sculptures, and this lack of everything only served to heighten their hideousness. I glanced at my companion, but found him gazing expressionlessly straight before him. If he had examined the bas-reliefs and sculptures, he had done so less openly. I felt that it would not be wise any longer to stare at those oddly disturbing ornaments. So I followed Phelan's example. It was still possible, however, to notice that the hall was rapidly filling up with more people than the events of the day would have persuaded me to believe still lived in the city. There were close to 400 seats, and soon all were filled. When it became evident that there were still others to be seated, Phelan left his seat and stood up against the wall near the entrance. I did likewise, so that a pair of decrepit oldsters hideously changed in appearance from the younger element, for the creases at their necks had grown more scaly and were deeper, and their eyes bulged glassily, could sit down. Our relinquishment of our seats passed unnoticed, for a few others were already standing along the walls. It must have been close to half past nine for the summer evening was long and the darkness did not fall early before anything took place. Then suddenly there appeared through a rear entrance a middle-aged man clad in strangely decorated vestments. At first glance his appearance was priestly, but it was soon manifest that his vestments were blasphemously decorated with the same frog-like and fish-like representations which in plaque and sculpture ornamented the hall. He came to the image on the dais, touched it reverently with his hands, and began to speak. Not Latin or Greek as I had at first supposed he might speak, but an odd, garbled language of which I could not understand a word, a horribly suggestive series of mouthings which immediately started a kind of low, almost lyrical humming response from the audience. At this point Phelan touched my arm and slipped away out the entrance. I was meant to follow, and did so despite my reluctance to leave the ceremonies just as they were beginning. What's the matter? I asked. Ahab Marsh is not there. He may still come. Phelan shook his head. I think not. We must look for him elsewhere. He walked with such purpose that I assumed correctly, as it turned out, that he knew or suspected where he might find Ahab Marsh. 
I have thought that Phelan would go directly to the old Marsh home on Washington Street, but he did not. My second guess was that he would lead the way back to the refinery, and in this I was certain that I was correct, until we reached the refinery, crossed the bridge over the Manuxet nearby, and went on to strike out along the seashore, beyond the harbor at the mouth of the river. The night was dark, save for a waning late-rising moon, pushing up out of the eastern horizon and making its glade yellowly on the water, if feebly. Stars shone above. A bank of dark clouds lay low among the southern rim of heaven. A light east wind blew. Do you know where you're going, Phelan? I asked finally. Yes. We were following a little used road which had been marked private and which led crazily along the coast there over stones and sands, rocks and ruts. In one place Phelan dropped to his knees and lightly touched the sandy ruts. This road has been recently used. The sand was freshly disturbed, unlike the cake sand all around. By Ahab, I asked. He nodded thoughtfully. There is a little cove just ahead. This is marshland. Old Obed bought it more than a century ago. We hastened on, though we instinctively walked with more caution. On the shore of the sheltered cove, we found a curtain car in which Ahab Marsh had that day left the refinery. Unafraid, perhaps because of what he knew he would find there, my companion went directly up to it. There was no one in the car, but on the back seat, thrown carelessly down, were clothes, a man's clothes. And even in the dark, I recognized the suit Ahab Morsh had worn that day. But Phelan closed the car door and hurried round to the other side, passed the car down to the sea's edge, where he dropped his knees once more and looked down. The shoes were there. I saw when I knelt at my companion's side, the socks too, thick woolen socks, though the day had been very warm. And the shape of the shoes in that wan moonlight were strangely upsetting. How wide they were! How curiously shaped! At one time, surely, normal shoes, if a little large, but now plainly worn out of shape, as if the foot inside had been, well, as if a kind of distorting disease had afflicted the wearer's feet. And there was something else, something all the more hideously frightening in that yellow moonlight, with a sea sound and that other sound, the sound to which Phelan cautioned me to listen. A kind of distant undulation, non-human in origin, coming not from the land at all, but from the sea, far, far out the sea, and Devil Reef, haunted in the channels of my memory by everything I had heard from that storekeeper, and later on from my companion, the stories of strange, evil, unholy traffic between sea creatures and the people of Innsmouth the things Obed Marsh had found on Panape and that other island, the terror of the last 1920s with the strange disappearances of young people, human sacrifices put to sea and never returned. It rose in the east and came in on the wind, a ghastly chanting that sounded like something from another world, a liquid undulation, a watery sound defined description but evil beyond any experience of man. And it rode the wind into my horrified consciousness while my eyes were fixed still to that terrible evidence so plain on the sandy beach between the place where Ahab Marsh's shoes and socks were and where the water began. The footprints, not of human feet, but of pedal extremities that were squat with elongated digits, thick, wide, and webbed. The events that came after I hesitate to write, and yet from the moment Andrew Phelan knew there was no need for further delay. It was Ahab Marsh who was the object of his search, and only to a considerable lesser degree the worshippers in the order of Dagon Hall. The sacrifices, he said, had been going on again, with greater secrecy just as in Obed Marsh's day, ever since the debacle of 1928 and 1929. The Innsmouthers had been more careful. Those who had been left and those who had filtered back into the town after the Federals had gone. And Ahab, 
Ahab, who had shed his clothing and gone into the sea only to turn up the next day, as if nothing untoward had taken place. Could anyone doubt but that he had swum out to Devil Reef? And could anyone doubt what had happened to the young Innsmouth man who had driven his car that night? For that was the way of sacrifice, the chosen of Ahab, to work for Ahab and be prepared, unknowing for the sacrifice to those hellish creatures which rose from the depths of Yahanalfei beyond the shunned and feared Devil Reef, which in low tide stood blackly and evilly above the dark waters of the Atlantic. For Ahab Marsh was back next day, back at the refinery with another young man to drive his car around and take him for those short distances from the immense old Marsh home on tree-shrouded Washington Street to, to the refinery building near the falls of the Manuxet. But all night long, from our room in the Gilman House, we listened. It was not only the sounds from the sea borne by the east wind that we heard. There were other things besides that ghastly undulation. There were the terrible screams, the hoarse, animal-like screams of a man in mortal terror. There was that frightful chant which came simultaneously from the assembled members of the esoteric order of Dagon, gathered together in that hall, with its horrible sculptures and bas-reliefs and that grotesque and bestial miniature of a creature evil beyond the concept of man, that horrible mouthing which made its impact weirdly on the night air. Cthulhu Rilie, ever repeated a ritual phrase which Philan translated in his hushed voice as, In his house at Rilie, dead Cthulhu, waits dreaming. In the morning my companion went out only long enough to assure himself that Ahab Marsh had returned. Then he came back to the hotel and lost himself in study, leaving me to my own devices for the remainder of that day, and adjuring me only to refrain from making myself in any way conspicuous. I had already resolved to do nothing to attract attention, but nevertheless I was determined to follow up the hints of terrible human sacrifices and horrible rites performed by certain of the Innsmouth people which Andrew Phelan had given me, and accordingly I made my way back to the First National Store and Mr. Henderson. The storekeeper did not recognize me, which was a tribute to Phelan's skill. He adopted toward me that same servile attitude which he had used to the wait woman who had entered his store when I was last in it, and when we were alone, for someone else was in the store at my entrance, and I attempted to identify myself it was almost impossible to do so. Plainly, Henderson thought at first that one of the Innsmouth people had somehow learned of our previous conversation, and it was only when I repeated to him many of the things that he had said that he acknowledged me for whom I was. But he was fearful still. If they find out, he exclaimed in a harsh, ominous whisper. I assured him no one knew of my real identity, and none would save, of course, Henderson, whom I felt certain could be trusted. He guessed that I had been looking into things, as he put it, and with considerable agitation again urged me to take myself off. Some of them seem to be able to smell people who are not like them. I don't know how they do it, as if they read a man's mind or his heart. And if they catch you like this, why? Why? Why what, Mr. Henderson? You'll never get back to where you came from. I assured him with a self-confidence. I was far from feeling that I had no intention of getting caught. I had come to him now for more information. Despite the violent shaking of his head, I would not take his negative answer. Perhaps he knew nothing, yet I must ask. Had there been any disappearances, particularly of young men and women from Innsmouth in the years he had been here? He nodded furtively. Many? Maybe twenty or so. When the order meets, they don't meet often. It usually comes out after that. On the nights the order meets, somebody just isn't heard from again. They say they've run away. First few times I heard it, I didn't find that hard to believe. I could understand why they'd want to run away from Innsmouth. But then, 
There were those other things. The people who disappeared usually always worked for Ahab Marsh. And there were those old stories about Obed Marsh. How he carried people out to Devil Reef and came back alone. Zadok Allen had talked about it. They said Zadok was crazy. But Zadok said things and there was certain clinching evidence to support what the crazed old man said. He talked like that. And he had spells, Henderson said, until he died. By the way he said it, I gathered that Zadok Allen had not just died. You mean until they killed him, I countered? I didn't say so. I'm not the one to say anything. Mind you, I never saw a thing. Anyway, nothing you could make something of. I never saw anyone disappear. I just didn't see them anymore. That's all. Later on, I heard about it. Somebody dropped a word about it here and there, and I picked it up. Nothing ever got into the paper. Nothing ever was said so it could. No one ever made any search or any attempt to get trace of the missing ones. I couldn't help thinking about the stories old Zadok Allen and those others whispered about Captain Obed Marsh. Might be it's all in my mind. It would affect a man's mind to live in a place like this for as many years as I've been here. It would affect some men and just as many months. I'm not the one to say old Zadok Allen was crazy. All I say is that I don't think he was. And he never talked much until he had a little something to drink. That loosened his tongue. And usually next time he was sober he seemed to be mighty sorry he said anything. Walking along and looking over his shoulder all the time. Even in broad daylight. And always looking out toward the sea. Out to where you can see the line of Devil Reef. When the tide is low and the day is clear. The inn's mouthers don't look out there much. But sometimes when there's a meeting at the Order of Dagon Hall, there are lights out there, strange lights. And there are lights from the cupola of the old Gilman house, just flashing back and forth, as if it was talking going on between them. You've seen those lights yourself? It's the only thing I've seen. Might be a boat, but I don't think so. Not out there at Devil Reef. Have you ever been out there? He shook his head. No, sir. Don't have any wish to go. I got close to it one time in a launch. Ugly gray stone with some mighty strange shapes to it. And I didn't want to get any closer. It was just like something driving you away. Like a big hand reaching out invisible and pushing you back. That's the way it was. Made my skin crawl. My hair tingle along the back of my neck. I never forgot it, and that was before I heard much, so I never put it down to what was suggested or hinted at, and something getting to work on my nerves or my imagination. Ahab Marsh is the power here in Innsmouth, then. That he is. That's because there's not a weight or a gilman or an orn left, not a man, that is, just the women, and they're growing old. The men all vanished about the time the Federals came in here. I turned him back to the subject of those mysterious disappearances. It seemed incredible that young men and women could simply drop out of existence to this day and age, and never a word of it printed anywhere. Oh, responded Henderson, I didn't know in's mouth if I thought that was impossible. They were closed mouth, close as clams. And if they figured it was something they had to do for their pagan god or whatever it was they worshipped, they never complained. They just took it and made the best of it. And they were all mortally afraid of Ahab Marsh. He came close to me, so close that I was aware of his quickened pulse. I touched him once, just once, and that once was enough. God, he was cold cold as ice and where I touched him between the end of his glove and his coat sleeve. He drew back right away and gave me a look. The skin was moist cold, like a fish. He shuddered at the memory of it, touched the handkerchief to his temples and broke away. Aren't they all like that? No, they're not. The others are different. 
They say the marshes were all cold-blooded, especially since Captain Obed's time. But I've heard differently. You take that fellow, Williamson, I think his name was, who brought the Federals here. They didn't know it at the same time, but he was a marsh. He had Orn blood in him, too. And when they found out, they just waited for him to come back. And he did come. He came back, they said, and he went right down to the water singing, they said. And he took off his clothes, and he dove in, and began swimming out toward the reef, and never a word of him since. Mind you, I didn't see it myself, it's just what I heard, though it took place in my own time. Those with marsh blood in them always come back, no matter how far away they are. Look at Ahab Marsh, come from God knows where. Once started, Henderson proved to be unusually loquacious, despite his fears. Doubtless, the long periods of abstinence and his conversations with outsiders had something to do with it, as well as the security his shop afforded him, for it was not often visited in the morning hours. The Innsmouth people preferred to shop in late afternoon, and he was free and often obliged to keep his store open beyond the usual six o'clock closing hour. He talked of the strange jewelry worn by the Innsmouthers, those grotesque and repulsive armlets and tiaras, the rings and pectorals with repellent figures cut in high relief on them, all. I could not doubt that they were the same as those figures of the bas reliefs and sculptures in the order of Dagon Hall. Henderson had seen pieces on occasion. Those who belonged to the order wore them, and certain of the debased churches had them too. He spoke about the sounds from the sea, a kind of singing, and it's no human voice that does it. What is it? I don't know. No inclination to find out either. It wouldn't be healthy. It comes from somewhere out there, like last night, his voice dropped to whisper. I know what you mean. He hinted at the other sounds, though he did not once mention the hoarse, terrified screams. He had nonetheless heard them. And there were other things, he muttered, darkly, things far more terrible, things that went back to old Obed Marsh and still lived in the waters beyond Devil Reef. There was that suppressed talk about Obed himself, how he was not really dead, how a party of boating people from Newburyport Way who knew the Marsh family came into port one day all pale and shaking and said they had seen Obed out there swimming like a porpoise and if it was not Obed Marsh, then what was in his likeness? What was it the Newberry Porters had seen? No plain fish would scare men and women like that. And why did the Innsmouthers try so hard to keep it quiet? They shut up the Newberry Port people all right, probably because they were strangers and they didn't really want to believe what it was they saw out there near, near Devil Reef. But there were things swimming out there. Others had seen them, things that dove and disappeared and never came up again, though they looked like men and women, except that they were sometimes scaly and with odd wrinkled and shiny skin. And what happened to so many of the old folks? There never seemed to be funerals nor bearings, but certain of them got queerer looking every year, and then one fine day went down to the sea and first thing people knew they were reported lost at sea or drowned or something like that. It was true the things swimming in the sea were not often seen by day, but at night. And what was it, what manner of creature was it that came climbing out of the sea onto Devil Reef? And why did certain of the Innsmouthers go out there in the night? He seemed to grow more and more excited as he talked, though his voice grew more hushed and it was readily patent that he had brooded a great deal about everything he had heard since he came to Inn's mouth, and was held to it by a fascination over which he had no control, a fascination which existed side by side with an utter and almost morbid loathing. It was almost noon when I made my way back to the Gilman house. My companion had finished his study, and he now listened to what I had to say with the utmost gravity though I could detect nothing in his attitude to reveal that he had not previously been aware of what Henderson had said and hinted. 
After I finished, he said nothing, only nodded, and went on to explain our coming movements. Our period of stay in Innsmouth was almost over, he said. We would leave the city just as soon as we had dealt with Ahab Marsh, and that might be tonight. It might be tomorrow night, but it would be soon, for all was in readiness. Meanwhile, however, there were certain aspects of the strange pursuit of which I must know, and chief among them was the danger to myself. I am not afraid, I hastened to say. No, perhaps not in the physical sense, but it is impossible to say what they might do to you. All of us carry a talisman which is potent against the deep ones and the minions of the old ones, but not against the old ones themselves or their immediate servitors, who also come to the surface of the earth on special missions to destroy such of us as learn the secrets and oppose the coming again of great Cthulhu and those others. So saying, he placed before me a small five-pointed star made of a stone material foreign to me, a gray stone, and instantly I remembered reading of it in the library at Miskatonic University. The five-pointed star, carbon of gray stone from ancient Menar, which had the power of the Elder Ones in its magic. I took it wordlessly and put it into my pocket, as feeling indicated I should. He went on. This might afford me partial terrestrial protection, but there was a way of further escape if danger from the immediate servitors of Cthulhu menaced. I too might come to Seleno if I wished, though the way was terrible and it would be required of me that I enlist the aid of creatures who, while in opposition to the Deep Ones and all others who served great Cthulhu, were themselves essentially evil, for they served Hastur, the unspeakable, laired in the Black Lake of Hali and the Hyads. In order that these creatures be made to serve me, however, it would be necessary for me to swallow a small pellet a distillation of that marvelous golden mead of Professor Shrewsbury, the mead which rendered the drinker insensible to the effects of time and space, and enabled him to travel in those dimensions, while at the same time heightening his sensory perceptions, then to blow upon a strange stone whistle, and also to call forth into space certain words. La la hastor hastor. Hastor, certain flying creatures, the Baikahi, would come out of space, and I was to mount and take flight unafraid, but only if danger pressed close, for the danger of the Deep Ones and all who are allied to them, insisted Philon, is as great to the soul as to the body. To all this I listened in amazement, not untouched by a kind of spiritual terror, that terror so common to men who for the first time look out into the void of greater space, who begin to contemplate seriously for the initial time the vastness of the outer universes, a terror induced by the instinctive knowledge that it was by this means of travel that Andrew Phelan had reached my room in Boston, and it was by this means that he had originally gone forth more than a year ago. So saying, Phelan gave into my hands the little golden pellets, three of them in case I should lose one, and also a tiny whistle, which he warned me never to blow upon save in the dire need he had outlined, unless I were prepared for fateful consequences. This much he said he could do for my protection, and he made it plain that we would not be returning to Arkham together, though we might set out for that town in each other's company. They will expect us to go back to Newburyport, he said. So we will follow the railroad tracks toward Arkham. That is shorter, in any case, and by the time they may be ready to pursue, we shall be well out of their way. Immediately when our work is done, we will make for the railroad. We will wait long enough to be sure that our work here is accomplished. He paused significantly and then added that pursuit from Innsmouth by the people themselves we need not fear. What other then? When that other comes, you will know without prior explanation, he answered ominously. By nightfall, we were prepared. I did not, not as yet fully know Andrew Phelan's plan, but I knew that the first step necessary would be to empty the Washington Street house of the marshes of the two women who were there. 
To this end, Phelan sent them a prosaic note saying that an elderly relative had arrived to put up at the Gilman house, and being in ill health and unable to call, would enjoy a visit that evening at nine o'clock from the Misses Eliza and Ethelai Marsh. It was a commonplace letter, correct in every detail save that my companion embellished it with a reproduction of that seal of Dagon, and again impressed the seal and wax upon the flap of the envelope. He had signed the name of Wilkin, knowing that there had years ago been marriage between the Marshes and the Wilkins, and he felt certain that this letter would take the Marsh woman from the house for the length of time required for what must be done to destroy the leadership of the minions of Cthulhu at Innsmouth, and so retard whatever progress had been made in preparing the way for the rising again, the coming from the, his house of that dread being dreaming deep in the waters under the earth. He dispatched this letter near supper time and instructed the desk clerk that if anyone should telephone, he would be back directly. Then we went out, Phelan carrying a little valise into which he had put some of the things he had brought with him in the pockets of that robe he had worn on his arrival. The sky was overcast, which my companion was pleased to see, for at nine there would otherwise still have been some twilight. Now, however, at that hour, the night would be dark enough for our purpose. If all went as he hoped, the Marsh women would travel to the Gilman house by car, driven by the new man that would leave Ahab alone in that old mansion. Phelan explained that he had no qualms. If the women did not respond to that message, they too must be destroyed. Much as he disliked the thought of proceeding against them in the same fashion as against Ahab, we had no difficulty in finding a place of adequate concealment from which we could watch the Washington Street house, for the street was heavily grown with trees, thus affording shadows and dark corners. The house across the way was shrouded in darkness, save for a tiny light that gleamed in a room on the second floor, but just before nine o'clock a light went on up downstairs. They're coming, whispered my companion. He was right, for in a few moments that black curtain car rolled round to the front entrance, and the two marsh women, heavily veiled, came from the house and entering the car drove away. Phelan lost not an instant. He crossed the street into the dark grounds of the Marsh estate and there at once opened his valise, which contained scores of the five-pointed stars, all very small. These, he said, were to be used to circle the house, particularly in the vicinity of the doors and windows. We must work silently and swiftly, for if these talismans were not laid down, Ahab might escape. But he could not cross these stones. He could not pass by them in any way. I hastened to do Phelan's bidding, and soon met him coming around the other way. The darkness was urgent with foreboding. At any moment, the Marsh woman might come back. At any second, Ahab Marsh might become aware of someone in the grounds, though we made no sound. It will soon be over, said Phelan, then. Whatever happens, be still. Do not be alarmed. He then disappeared once more around to the back of the house. He was gone but a few minutes before he returned to where I stood in the shadow of a bush near the front entrance. But he did not pause. He went on up to the front door and there busied himself for a few moments. When he stepped away, I saw thin flame growing at one corner of the door. He had fired the house. He joined me looking grimly and emotionlessly towards the single window where light burned. Only fire will destroy them, he said. You might remember that, Abel. You may encounter them again. We'd better get away. Wait. We must make sure of Ahab. The fire ate rapidly at the old wood, and already at the rear of the house the flames slid up the close pressing trees. At any moment someone might see, somewhat might give the alarm which would summon the rickety old Innsmouth Fire Department vehicles. But in this we were fortunate, for the Innsmouthers generally shunned the places where Ahab Marsh lived and worked, fearing and respecting the Marshes, even as their ancestors had feared and respected those earlier members of that accursed family who had trafficked with beings out of the sea and so had brought into this seaport town a blight of horrible misignation 
which had left its mark upon all their progeny. Suddenly the window of that lit room was thrown open, and Ahab leaned out. He was there for but an instant. Then he withdrew, not troubling to shut the window, and thus creating an effective draft for the flames from below. Now, whispered Andrew Phelan urgently, the front door was torn open and Ahab Marsh bounded out past the flames in one great leap. But he went no further. He came down, took one step, and then recoiled, his arms upflung. A horrible guttural cry welled from his thick lips. Behind him the flames mounted and spread, aided by the draft through the open door. Already the heat must have been awful where he stood. For what happened then is seared upon my consciousness for all time. The clothes worn by Ahab Marsh began to fall from him in flames as he stood there. First those curious mittens on his hands, then the black skull cap and the clothes about his body, and this so swiftly that he seemed literally to burst from his clothes. What stood there then was not human. It was not a man. It was a hellish, frog-like, lizard-like travesty of a man whose hands were frog-like and webbed, great pads instead of hands, whose body was scaled and tentacled and gleamed with a moisture so natural to its coldness, a body which had been bound into the unnatural clothing of a human being, but which now that that clothing had fallen away and the tight linens binding it to fit into that clothing as well resembled a thing out of an unknown dark corner of earth's forbidden places a terrible ghastly thing that walked in the guise of a man but had gills beneath the wax ears which melted off in the heat of that destructive fire where that creature slowly backed into the flames rather than dare the power of those stones laid end to end around the house whimpering and crying bestially in a kind of undulation i had heard before small wonder ahab marsh had been able to swim from ashore out to Devil Reef. Small wonder he had carried sacrifices to the waiting host out there in the depths. For the creature in the guise and identity of Ahab Marsh was not a Marsh at all. He was not a human being. The thing that called itself Ahab Marsh, the thing the Innsmouth people so blindly followed, was one of the Deep Ones itself, come from the sunken city of Yah enough light to resume again the work once begun by the terrible Obed Marsh at the behest and bidding of the minions of Great Cthulhu. As in a dream, I felt Andrew Phelan's touch upon my arm. I turned and followed him into the shadowed street, down which even now came that curtained car carrying the Marsh woman back to that unhallowed house. We fled, skulking in the shadows. There was no need to return to the Gilman house for we had left money in our room to pay for our lodgings, and nothing of importance and personal belongings had been left. We went directly toward the railroad track and made our way out of that justly shunned city. A mile beyond the town we turned and looked back. The redness of the sky in that place told us that what was happening, the fire in that ancient tinder house had spread to neighboring houses but something of even more portentous significance took place. For silently my companion pointed seaward, and there, far out on the rim of the sky, I saw strange green flashes of light, and looking swiftly back towards Innsmouth, I saw other lights flashing from a high place, which could have been none other than the cupola of the Gilman house. Then Andrew Phelan took my hand. Goodbye, Abel, I am going to leave you here. You will remember everything I have said. But they will find you, I cried. He shook his head. You go on along the tracks. Lose no time. I'll be all right. I did as I was bidden, knowing that every moment's delay was potentially fatal. I could not have gone far when I heard that strange, unearthly whistling sound, and shortly thereafter the voice of Andrew Phelan shouting triumphantly into space, Ya, ya, hastur, hastur. Involuntarily, I turned. There, silhouetted against the red-hued sky over Innsmouth, I saw a great flying thing, a great bat-like bird that came sweeping down and was lost briefly in the darkness. The Bayaki. Then it rose up again, and it was not alone. 
Something more was there between its great wings where it mounted swiftly out of sight. Daring danger, I ran back. Of Andrew Phelan, there was no sign. It is now almost a fortnight since the events of that week. The Divinity School has known me no more. I have been haunting the library of Miskatonic University, and I have learned more, much more, about things Andrew Phelan would not tell me. And I understand better now what it was that went on in a cursed inn's mouth, things that are going on in other remote corners of this earth which is always and forever a great battleground for the forces of good and those of evil. Two nights ago, for the first time, I saw that I was being followed. Perhaps I was wrong in tearing from my face all those disfiguring things Andrew Phelan had put there to give me the in-smouth look, and leaving them lie along the little-used tracks in the direction of Arkham, where they might be found. Perhaps it was not the in-smouth people who found them, but something other, something that came out of the sea that night in response to those signals from the cupola of the Gilman house. Yet my follower of two nights ago was an Innsmouth man, surely. His odd, frog-like appearance was unmistakable. Of him, however, I had no fear. I had the five-pointed star stone in my pocket. I felt safe. But last night came the other. Last night I heard the earth move under me. I heard the sound of great sluggish sucking footsteps slogging along in the waters of the earth, and I knew what Andrew Phelan meant when he said that I would know when last other pursuers came. I know. I have made haste to put this down, and I will send it to the library at Miskatonic University to be put with Dr. Shrewsbury's papers and what they call the Phelan Manuscript, written by Andrew Phelan before he went to Salerno for the first time. It is late, and I have the conviction that I am not alone. There is an unnatural hush about the entire city, and I can hear those horrible sucking sounds from far beneath. In the east, the Pleiades and Seleno have begun to rise above the horizon. I've taken the little golden pellet made from Dr. Shrewsbury's mead. I have the whistle here beside me. I remember the words, and if the heightening of awareness that is certain to follow the taking of the me discloses something of what it is that dogs me now. I shall know what to do. Even now I am becoming aware of changes within me. It is as if the walls of the house fell away, as if the street too were gone in a fog. Something in that watery fog, like a giant frog with tentacles like a... Great God! What horror! Ya, ya! Hashtur! Hashtur! 